Hello students, welcome back to our course Environmental Modeling and Simulation. In today's lecture, I am going to go through non-reactive and hopefully reactive processes that happen in the environment and which need to be incorporated in your models. One thing I want to clarify, the processes that we are going to look at today are typically included in mass balance. When we are balancing a material that is passing through an environmental compartment or your control volume. However, some of these processes are also essential and need to be added when we are looking at dynamical systems using ordinary differential equations like we did for majority of lectures at the beginning of this class. So environmental non-reactive processes, what are they? These are physical processes or at times not necessarily physical but mostly non-reactive processes which affect the concentration of a contaminant in a given environmental phase, matrix or compartment. The first one that we are going to look at are adsorption and desorption. Now at this stage you are probably aware of what adsorption is and how it differs from uh, absorption which is moving from one phase to another. Uh, adsorption and desorption can happen for because of two driving reasons. One is the physiosorption. Now this is this happens due to mostly physical forces such as hydrophobic force, van der Waal forces, electrostatic forces and then we have hydrophobic forces. And um, yeah, the other driving cause for adsorption or desorption would be chemisorption. So this is typically when there is a covalent bond that forms between the adsorbed T and adsorbent. Okay, now typically the assumption that we use in our environmental system is that the concentration of the adsorbent on the adsorbed T and in the liquid or gas is linear, the relationship is linear. Concentration of adsorbate on adsorbent is proportional to concentration of adsorbate in the phase where it exists, in the fluid where it exists. And this relationship typically gives us isotherms. And the two most commonly used isotherms are so one is Langmuir isotherm and the other is Now the thing is that both of these isotherms and I suspect many of you are already familiar with them and I write down their equation now but uh, both, so both of these isotherms are non-linear which means when you include them in your model the computation or the analysis whether you are trying to do it geometrically or whether you are using computation is going to be incredibly difficult and challenging. So we make some assumptions one of the assumptions is that concentration of adsorbate on the adsorbent is much lesser than the actual capacity of the adsorbate to adsorb the adsorbent. And when we make such assumptions, these isotherms can be written in a linear fashion, which with this assumption, if it is true in our matrix, in our compartment, well, it makes our computation much easier. Okay, Langmuir isotherm looks like this. The concentration Cs is equal to ACW b c w so s is on the solid w is in the water so let's say we have soil particles and then we have water in the pore the concentration of the contaminant in the water is c w and the concentration so let me also paint the, the contaminant then so this is the contaminant in the water the contaminant in the solid it has adsorbed on the soil particles soil grains. So the concentration in the Cs is here and Cw is in the water they are linked like so this is not a linear system. A and B we can either find out uh, empirically by experimentation or there are certain methods to figure it out using calculations but mostly by experimentation A and B are given. Now the second isotherm looks like this 
it's much simpler as in system but again it's nonlinear. Cs which is concentration of your adsorbent on the adsorbate typically solid is given by a constant concentration in water 1 to the power n. Now if n is equal to 1 then this isotherm becomes a linear isotherm which is Cs is equal to Kg Cw makes much easier to compute to put it in your models. Um, when will n equal to 1? n will be equal to 1 when the maximum concentration that your solid can adsorb is never reached. It's too much. It's much bigger. So let's say C max is much, much bigger than Cs. In that case, n can be approximated as equal to 1. This becomes a linear isotherm, becomes easier to um, solve. Now, uh, remember at non-steady state, the flux, the movement of your adsorbent to the adsorbate will be proportional to the difference in the concentration between Cs max and Cs. So in under no, this is under steady state, under non-steady state what you get is dCs by dt is proportional to the difference in the concentration. So that is Cs max minus Cs and then we will have a proportionality constant. So I am putting partial derivative because Cs depends not just on time but on other things too but we can always make approximations also. So a constant and then we have Cs max minus Cs. So this is in non-steady state. Okay, if this is adsorption and desorption. The next non-reactive process is settling and resuspension. And I want to go over settling and resuspension by giving you an example of a lake. So let's say there is a lake and let's say we are looking at a toxicant or a contaminant and that contaminant uh, exists in the particle phase. So we have particles that are suspended in the water, the volume of the lake is V. Let me mention this is the lake. Now um, the contaminant which is in particular phase is also uh, getting adsorbed and desorbed in the water phase and the particles are settling down and then there is a particular settling velocity Vs. Now we need to include this in a model. So let's say the lake has an inlet, the lake has an outlet and the contaminant is settling down over time. How do you incorporate that in your model? If, if you assume this is completely well mixed, this is a CSTR system but you need to also account for the settling as part of removal of the contaminant. But in this case uh, for settling we need to know the settling velocity. And typically we use Stokes law to find out Stokes equation to find out settling velocity. You can also use, uh, I mean typically it is Stokes law but sometimes we also use empirical, we all empirical data to find out the settling velocity of the contaminant. Okay, um, I'm going to take the example of lake here and I'm going to even solve a question uh, regarding lake and the contaminant settling down. However, settling and resuspension is very important across environmental fields. For example, uh, to remove particulate matter from chimneys, we have electrostatic precipitators. That's where settling happens. So we also can use same principles to model the settling of particulate matter in chimney. Uh, also um, notice that settling can happen for many reasons, not just because of high voltage and the plasma that makes particulate matter get settled, but also because of gravity or buoyancy or um, some hydrodynamic forces or aerodynamic forces can also cause settling. Okay, so uh, when we talk about settling we are basically saying that the rate at which the mass is being removed in this case from the lake, so dm by dt, the rate at which the mass of contaminant is being removed will be proportional to the particulate matter concentration which is Pw, rate at which particulate matter concentration be assuming that the contaminant is in particulate form is changing with respect to time and then of course since we are talking about mass not concentration we need to multiply by V. Now with this is with assumption that the contaminant exists in particulate form not in the dissolved form. In this case you can very easily find out um, if you know this if this is the case you can very easily include this in your model. However sometimes we have other things going on we have adsorption desorption. So in that case I want to introduce four new terms with you one is Cs, Cw,
PW and CP. So now let's look into these each of these four terms, CS, CW, PW and CP. CS is the concentration that has been adsorbed divided by total solids present in the water in your lake. So this is the mass that has been adsorbed divided by total mass of solids in your water. Right, so we are looking at the concentration of the contaminant in the solid phase. For example, let's say overall we have one ton of solids in the water of the lake. What percentage, what is the concentration of the contaminant in this one ton of mass? Let's say one kilogram. Then the concentration in solid phase is one kilogram by one ton. CW is the concentration of the contaminant in water phase. So the way to figure this out is uh, what mass has been adsorbed divided by total volume of the lake. So this is basically 1 kg of contaminant in x meter cube volume will give me 1 kg by x meter cube CW, concentration of the contaminant in water. PW tells me the concentration of suspended particles. in water. For example, we have 10 milligram of suspended particles per liter or per 10 liter of water. That is PW. It's the concentration of particulate matter P in water, PW. So to find this, you need to know total suspended particles divided by total volume of the water. Now the fourth term, which is very important is CP. Now CP, what CP is telling me is total adsorbed contaminant divided by total volume. So basically mass adsorbed by total volume of the lake. This is CP. So basically what mass of the contaminant has adsorbed into the particulate matter divided by total volume of the lake. When we think of contaminant concentration in the water which is adsorbed in the particulate matter, what we are thinking of is CP. Now remember it is the mass that has been adsorbed into the solid phase into the particulate matter which will settle down following the Stokes law if it reaches the terminal velocity. So CP is very important. Now just by looking at these definitions, you can already tell that CP, PW and CS are related to each other because CP is talking about the mass of the contaminant adsorbed to the particulate matter. The concentration of particulate matter in the total volume of the lake is given by PW and the concentration of the contaminant within the particulate matter is given by CS. So what we can say is CP is equal to PW into CS. We are going to use this as we solve our solve a very simple equation. Of course, we know that the total contaminant present in the water would be given by Cp which is the mass on the particulate matter plus Cw which is uh, mass in the water. I need to correct myself here. This is not mass adsorbed. Cw is mass in water. So there are two things happening here. So let's say this is our water. Now we have particulate matters in the water and the contaminant is dissolved in the water phase and also adsorbed to the solid phase. So CS, CP are giving us information on the concentration in the particulate phase. CW is telling me about concentration in the water phase. CT is the total concentration of the contaminant or total amount mass T is equal to mass in water plus mass in solid phase which is in the um, which is in the water. So this is what we have. I need to introduce two more ratios, two more terms. First is the fraction of contaminant in dissolved form. So we know that the concentration in water is Cw and Ct is the total concentration of contaminant. When we divide them, so you will get a fraction of contaminant in dissolved form, which is 1 by 1 plus KFPW, right? F is the fractioning coefficient. Now, similarly, we can find out the fraction in particulate matter form, which will be 1 minus, let's say this is F, 1 minus F, so we get KFPW divided by 1 plus KFPW. So let's look at example number 2. So let's say we have a lake. Right? The volume of the lake is given to us, uh, actually the depth and the area of the lake is given to us. So the average depth is 30 feet and remember units are very important because some units would be SI, some would be FPS, some would be somewhere else. So always write the unit next to your data. 
and this lake is receiving some contaminants at a constant rate as so that your suspended particulate concentration becomes equal to 10 milligram per liter. Now the suspended solids that are coming into the lake are also bringing in a toxicant with them and that toxicant partitions into the water as well. That partitioning coefficient Kf is given by 2 lakh liters per kg. So this is your partitioning coefficient Kf. Now the particulate matter are settling down in the lake. So the settling velocity is given by 0.6 feet per day. So please take care of the units. And uh, this is concentration in water by the way, 10 milligram per liter. What else do we know? We know that the volume of the lake is 3 into 10 to power 6 cubic feet. Okay. Now let us find out, of course there is an exit too. Now let us find out uh, some the four terms that we talked about. First is adsorbed concentration. What part of the contaminant are adsorbed in the solid phase? So to find the adsorbed concentration, we know the concentration in water, we know the partition coefficient from water to the solid. So our adsorbed concentration will be product of these. So you just need to multiply Kf with Cw. Now keep a note on the units, make sure your units are consistent and you can find the CS. The next thing you need to find out is um, the rate at which the contaminant is settling. So to find the rate at which the contaminant is settling, you know the velocity and you know the depth. So Vs by D will give you the rate constant Ks. So you sub divide the velocity by the depth, you will get the Ks, rate constant. Okay, the third part of the question is, what are the dissolved and particulate fractions? So these F and 1 minus F. So if we know Kf, which we know, and if we know Pw, which is the uh, concentration of particulate matter in the water, then we can find out both F and 1 minus F. So um, Kf is given to us here. Okay, there's one missing data here. The total concentration of the contaminant is given to us as 10 microgram per liter, which is 10 to power minus 6 gram per liter. So uh, we need to find out particulate matter Pw will be equal to this concentration 10 to power minus 6 gram per liter multiplied by the concentration of the contaminant which is 10 milligram per liter. So you can find out Pw, put the value of Kf and you can find out both F and 1 minus F. Alright, the last thing we need to find out is the rate at which the solids are precipitating, settling down, settling rate of solids. This was settling constant. Last thing we need to find out is settling rate of the contaminant into sediment. And this we'll find out by Ks V P W. So V is the volume of the lake, P is the concentration of particulate matter in the lake, Ks is this V S by D. So basically settling rate divided by depth multiplied by concentration of the particulate matter into the volume of the lake. Okay, these are the typical questions that we ask and the four parameters that I talked about here which is concentration of the contaminant in solid phase divided by total solid volume, Cw which is the concentration in water, water phase. So Cs is in the solid phase, Cw is in the water phase. Remember Cs will be mass by mass, Cw will be mass by volume. Pw is the concentration of con uh, particulate matter, suspended solids in the water, so it's really mass by volume. And Cp is the mass absorbed by total volume, which is basically equal to product of the particulate matter concentration and the solid mass by mass concentration. Okay, once we figure this out, you can solve basically any lake question. Uh, remember all of these, these are very simple definitions that I'm giving you, but all of these in, are in, need to be incorporated in your mass balance or in your ordinary differential equation. Okay, the next non-reactive process that we are going to look at is volatilization or absorption. Now I'm putting volatilization volatilization and absorption. 
Now notice I am putting volatilization and absorption both in the same category even though they have two very different phenomena. And that is because in volatilization and in absorption the contaminant undergoes phase change. So it is transportation, non-reactive transportation, movement of the contaminant from one phase to another. And whether it is in volatilization or absorption the, phenom the models that we use to understand both dynamics of volatilization and absorption are quite similar. So very briefly, uh, for example, let us say we have VOCs in soil. So we have soil particles, soil grains and then the air here and let us say we have some VOCs here and they will be, some of them may be adsorbed to the, um, to the solid, some of them may be in the liquid, mixed in the liquid and then some of them will partition, volatilize into the air. So movement is happening from the liquid phase to the air or from solid phase into the air that is volatilization and um, it is typically considered to be a linear phenomenon. So volatilization will be proportional to the concentration gradient, the concentration difference between the concentration in liquid phase and the concentration in the air phase multiplied by a rate constant. Where do we apply this very simple system? Not just in volatilization of highly volatile organic compounds which sometimes contaminate our soil and our groundwater but also in systems where we aerate, for example in aeration tank when we are aerating our wastewater and biomass for effective degradation of organics. So anytime there is aeration or air stripping, we are, we are taking the contaminant from one phase to another. Remember the key here is movement from one phase to another, phase one to phase two. So any environmental feature which does this that is falling under volatilization and absorption whether it is stripping away a particular gas or uh, aeration or literally volatilization of contaminants. So I, I said that the um, volatilization and absorption are proportional to the concentration present in the, um, in the phase 1. So let us say here we have phase 1 and here we have phase 2. So let us say the current concentration in phase 1 is C1, current concentration in phase 2 is C2. In equilibrium the concentration in phase 1 will be C1 asterisk, then the volatilization will be proportional to C1 minus C1 asterisk. So if we are at C1 asterisk, volatilization will stop. But if the concentration is higher than the equilibrium concentration, then the contaminant will start moving from phase 1 to phase 2 and it will be proportional to this. So empirically or through some other method we need to figure out the C1 dash and once we know that whenever there is a phase transfer we are using this very simple, so we are including this very simple system in our model. Okay students this is all for uh, environmental non-reactive processes. In the next lecture we will go very briefly over environmental reactive processes and as a um, reminder remember that the, the reason I am introducing you to these very simple environmental processes is so that you can include them when you are doing mass balance. So for example, let us say we are transporting air, we are aerating a system and we know the rate at which the air is being pushed into the system, we know mass in, the rate at which it is being pushed in, the rate at which it is being released out from the system and we know that there is aeration happening. Now aeration is basically transportation of gas from one phase to another and this is where we come in. This is where we look at. We use this system also when we find out the Streeter Fraub's DO model, DO SAC curve model. All right, students, so this is all for today. Uh, catch you in the next lecture where we look at environmental reactive processes. Thank you.